Hey, good morning, South Point family. I'm Jason. And I'm Danielle, and we're so glad that you're joining us this morning. And whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube or for the best experience at southpointfreecom slash live, take a minute and share this message out on social, tag a friend or two, and invite them to join us this morning. Yeah, we would love for your friends to join us this morning. We have a great message prepared for you. And hey, if this is your first time joining South Point Church Online, we would love to get connected with you. We'd love to get you plugged in. And the way that you can do that is if you got your mobile phone, go ahead and pull that out. You can text the word WELCOME to 240-297-7400. We'd love to get connected with you. Yes, we want to connect with you. And today we're continuing our sermon series, uh, Game Changer, Jesus Changes Everything. And we are fortunate to hear from a guest speaker, Michael Miller. And so let's give him a warm South Point welcome in the chat. You can say, welcome, Michael. We're so excited to hear from you this morning. Yeah, Michael, we're super excited. And hey, Danielle, I don't know if you know about this uh, exciting event that happened last week. Okay, I don't know. Uh, let's see, July 11th, 7-Eleven, okay. at 7-Eleven. Okay. They had free Slurpee Day. Oh, and I knew so, that the date sounded familiar yeah. for some reason. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was super jacked about it. My favorite, I'm a cherry guy, honestly, okay. so Are I don't you? know what your favorite flavor I'm is. Kind of, I, I'm kind of embarrassed to say I'm not sure if I've ever had a Slurpee. So oh, really? Yeah, hmm. I'm, I'm going to have to try one. Yeah, welcome to planet Earth. I know. Yeah, so while Danielle's <laughs> trying to figure out what her favorite Slurpee is, go ahead and pop down in the chat. Let us know what your favorite Slurpee flavor is. For yeah, and then I'll know a flavor to try. That's okay. right. <laughs> and coming up in a few weeks, we have Baptism Sunday on August 4th. And so if you'd like to get signed up for baptism, uh, you can go to southpointforyou.com slash baptism. That's right. And hey, as you can see, the worship team is getting ready behind us. They're about to kick us off stage. So, but before we do that and jump into today's service, let's go ahead and look at what the Bible says in Colossians 3.15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. So let's go ahead and prepare our hearts and minds, and we're going to go ahead and worship this morning. And so let's get prepared for that and join the worship team now. Welcome to South Point, online and in the room. Please join us in worship this morning.
are just so grateful. How can we say thank you all oh, for a thousand times to sing the praises of our King and our Maker, Lord. Father, we thank you for life to the fullness. We thank you that you are hope, you are our strength, you are our peace, our comfort, our joy. Father, even when it doesn't make sense, Lord, you are all that we need you to be and even more in the name of Jesus. We thank you so much for Pastor Michael Miller this morning and his family. We thank you for bringing them safely here. We thank you for your word that you have prepared through him, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Because your word is alive and active, Lord, and it's even sharper than a double-edged sword. We know that your word that you have for us this morning, Lord, will penetrate through every area of our lives. The areas that we willingly allow you in, and even the places, the areas that we resist you, Lord, we surrender to your will and to your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Good morning. You may be seated. So, thinking about that song, Jesus Christ, you are my living hope. Are we in a time where we, like, need more than just hope? We need, like, living, breathing, giving us life hope, right? You have broken every chain. There is salvation in your name. So as Christ followers, as those of us who say, I follow Jesus, I don't follow a political party. I don't follow a human man. I follow Jesus. But in light of news events that happened yesterday, we need not only to make that our confession, but we need to make that the filter that we look at every day and the things that happen. Agreed? All right. So would you stand with me this morning? And can we agree in prayer that we need hope? We need Jesus. We, all of us, we need Jesus. Our country needs peace. And our world needs peace. Father, we're so very grateful for your word that says we can boldly come to your throne and we can ask of you that which we need. Father, our country needs peace. Our world needs peace. And we not only say, Lord, but just with open, wide open vulnerability, we say, we need you. We need what only you can bring to this time. And we trust that you will. And we will look at life through the lens of Jesus changes everything. We believe in you. We honor you. And we worship you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So good morning. Man, you guys are rock stars. It is hotter than heck out there, right? I was outside at 7.30 this morning, and can I just tell you, I hit that air and grouchy, immediately grouchy. But I'm up here, and I'm seeing you, and you guys have the smiliest, most welcoming faces, which is good, because we have someone special to welcome here in just a moment. I'm Elise. I'm part of the team here at South Point Church, and we are so glad that you're here. And if you're joining us online, thank you. We appreciate that, too. If it is your first time here at South Point, would you whip out your cell phone if you're at home or if you're right here in the room with us, and text the word welcome to 240 240- 297-7400. So when you text us that, it does a couple things. Number one, we'll send you back a little gift and say, good morning, we're glad you're here. How can we help you get connected? But also, truly, it encourages us to let us know that you're here. So if you would do that. The other thing at South Point is we send out an email every Friday with upcoming information on things that are happening at South Point Church. You can get that by texting the same number, 240-297-7400, but putting the word news in the text. Now, if you have already texted that and you've not been getting the emails, check your spam box. Check your spam box. Check your spam box. Gmail wants to have fisticuffs with South Point, especially on email, so check your spam box. Uh, it's a really great way to know what's coming up. And speaking of things that are coming up, does anybody know what's coming up here at South Point on August 4th? Yeah! Good morning, Beth! 
baptisms are coming up on August 4th, and I know maybe you think I'm silly, but can I just tell you, it is one of the most incredibly amazing things. We call them baptism celebrations at South Point because that's what it is. We get together, we get to have fun, we get to watch somebody make a confession in front of public that they are stepping from death into life. It is phenomenal. Now, if you've been thinking about getting baptized, maybe you're not sure what's involved, or maybe you're having a little bit of hesitation because it is a public declaration, you want some more information or you just want somebody to encourage you, you can go to southpointforyou.com slash baptisms. Sign up to speak to one of our pastors. We'll give you more information. Everybody else, make sure you come out on August 4th because it is one of the best things ever. Now, as we go through South Point uh, message today, if something's on your shoulders or in your heart and you need a little extra prayer, please come to this side of the stage after service and our prayer team will meet you to pray with you. Now, if you're newer to South Point Church, we have a number of core values that lead who we are, where we're going, what we're doing, and point us exactly to true north, Jesus. And one of the things we say is we are contributors, not consumers. So you'll notice we're not going to pass an offering basket. We do know that God commands us to give a part of what we have, but we absolutely believe that the heart of that generosity is between you and God. So if you'd like to give at South Point, please go online or there's a kiosk out there and we can do that as well. Now, as I mentioned this morning, we've got a very special person we'd like to welcome. We have a special guest speaker from Arundel Community Church, Pastor Michael Miller. He's come this morning. He gave a great message in the nine o'clock service. You're going to love it. Um, Please give him a warm South Point welcome as he comes. He and his wife are here. They're foster parents, and they are phenomenally kind and sweet people. So would you give a warm South Point welcome, and God bless you guys. Have a great Sunday. Good morning, church. Uh, well, hey, I'm Mike Miller. I am one of the pastors from Arundel Christian Church in Glen Burnie. Last service, I was surprised to find out there's a number of people, actually, that has been to Glen Burnie before. Have any of y'all been to Glen Burnie? All right, y'all, y'all get around. That's pretty cool. Well, hey, I'm excited to be here today with you. I'm so excited that y'all have uh, opened your, your platform to me to allow me to speak into your lives today. Uh, I want to say a special thanks to Pastor Matt. Our pastor back at Arundel Christian Church is also a Pastor Matt. And so it's pretty ironic, but I uh, just want to say thank you to him for allowing me to be here. And, and uh, thanks for Ty. We went fishing yesterday. We didn't catch anything, but we went fish. I'm just going to go and tell everybody. If y'all know where he needs to go to bring me next time, let him know. Uh, <laughs> I like to fish. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But uh, before we get into the message, I want to tell you a little bit about me uh, and my family. I have a gorgeous wife that's sitting over here on the second row. We, uh, we have a daughter... Uh, who is someone that was weird we have a daughter who's right here she's nine years old and uh we'll hear a lot about her a little bit later as well and then we have three foster kids that are all in diapers and so yeah um you can leave it at that for now (laughs) Uh, I, I do want to tell you, too, I am an outdoorsman, so we're going to talk a little bit about some hunting and stuff. I like to hunt and fish and cycle and do all kinds of things, uh, but I am from the greatest country in the world. Does anyone know where that is? Texas. Texas. You got some Texans in the room. Look at that. Look at that. Texans know what's up. But yeah, um, I got married in 2011 here in Maryland, actually, and then I moved my wife back to Texas. Um, 
God brought us back to Glen Burnie of all places. <laughs> but uh, yeah, let's get into the message. So if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and take your Bibles out and turn to Matthew chapter 19. It'll be on the screen here, or you can use your phones as well. But Matthew chapter 19, today we are in week two of your series called Game Changer, Jesus Changes Everything. How many of you know that the name of Jesus is powerful? Look, I'm going to tell you a lot of stories today because I like to tell stories, but there was a, this time, has anyone ever been to Arundel Mills Mall? Yes. You go there during the holiday season, it's, it's the worst. There was a time uh, several years ago, me and my wife went to Arundel Mills and we were driving lane after lane after lane. We were looking for parking. Uh, they made it worse, obviously, if you've been there in, like, in the last 15 years or so. They made it worse by adding that, that live building out there on the, on, in the parking lot. So we were driving back and forth, back and forth, and then that thing happened where you get stuck behind someone who's waiting on someone to park, right, or to, to leave their parking spot, and the other side, someone else is waiting on, some, on another car. Meanwhile, the people that are, who just got in their cars, they're like finishing up a Netflix series or something because they were taking forever. I mean, we waited forever, and this guy pulls up behind me, and he's like honking his horn. Our windows crack because it's nice and cool outside. It's, it's, you know, we're leading up to Christmas at this point, and it had the windows crack. He's honking, and he's cussing me out and stuff. And I'm like, what am I going to do? I'm a Texan. This is not smart for him. I, have, I had anger management problems at the time. And uh, I was like, this is not going to end well for him. And he decided he wanted to get out of the car, and he walked up, started coming towards the window. And I was like, ooh, Jesus, you better help me. Holy Spirit. Uh, I was definitely thinking about getting out of the car and exchanging some words or some hands. I don't know, not a, not a handshake, if you know what I mean. But uh, I didn't. And said, I said, Holy Spirit, I need you to guide me. And I said, you know, I'm going to take a different approach to this. And I said, man, look, there's cars in front of me. There's cars coming the other way. I, there's nowhere I can go. We are gridlocked. What do you want me to do? And that guy kept cussing me out. And I said, you know what? I'm going to take this even more different. I'm going to drastic measures here. I said, you know what? Jesus loves you. His eyes got as wide as watermelons, and he started backing up as fast as he could. He didn't take his eyes off me the whole way back. Look, I tell you this story to remind you, the name of Jesus is powerful, and I fully believe in the name of Jesus, and I fully believe that Jesus can change your marriage, and you know, I, I understand that some people in this room, you may be... Uh, you may be divorced, you may be too young to get married, or single, or widowed, or a teenager, or a kid, I don't know, but whatever the case is, I pray that God will speak to you today, and that you'll learn something that's useful in your future. So let's go ahead and bow our heads and pray real quick. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray, Lord, that you would speak to us, that you would change us and transform our lives for the good, for your glory. God, I pray, Lord, that you would be with us today, be in this room, and be in our marriages. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'll give you a warning. Um, we have a newborn in our house. It's four weeks old, and so I don't sleep a lot. And the more tired I get, the more my Texan accent comes out. So you might hear Jesus, and you might hear Jesus. Just go with it, all right? But how many of you have ever looked up marriage statistics online? I, I, I was doing some research, and, and I just kind of Googled marriage statistics. And I was shocked at what I seen. I mean, I wasn't really, really shocked, to be honest. I was shocked at some numbers that I'll share with you, but I wasn't shocked to see that the marriage rates are, are declining while divorce rates are increasing, while uh, children born outside of marriage is increasing, single parenting is increasing. I found a number of back in 2022 is the latest number that I could find. I'm sure it's even higher based on the percentages growing. 673,989 divorces took place in 2022. That's 43% of marriages. Now, your second and third marriage people, their rates are way higher than that. It was like 20% higher, maybe 15. I can't remember exactly. But then I, I, I got to looking a little bit further back. I went back to 2008. Barna Group is a research group. They, they studied... Uh, they did a, a study with about 4,000 people, and they found that it would, the, the percentage at the time in 2008 was 33%. Now, Christians, this is sad, was only 1% behind that, 32% divorce rate. You know, a lot of people assume that Christians, that they don't, have, they don't have the same struggles in their marriages or divorces don't happen as frequently. The unfortunate reality is that many Christians have the same struggles as non-believers. Many Christians have sometimes more problems because of the way that they look at things uh, as non-believers. You know, in Matthew 19, 
It says, some Pharisees came to him to test him, to Jesus. And they, they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Church, just like Jesus, people will tell you that the Pharisees, people will test you the same way that the Pharisees tested Jesus. They will come at you, the enemy will come at you, the world will come at you, and they will try to cause disruption, disagreement, and discontent in your marriage. The Bible teaches us, though, that the, from the very beginning, the way that marriage was designed from the very, from the very start of, the, of, of creation, God intended marriage to be one man and one woman, and it's inseparable. It said, let no one separate. I'll tell you this. Me and my wife, uh, you know, we, when we got married, we were both Christians. We both loved God. We both wanted our marriage to work. I think most people would agree they'd want their marriage to work. At, at least in the beginning, a lot of people will say they wanted that. We understood that based on this biblical concept, we were, you know, I was supposed to leave my family and cleave to my wife. We understood all of that. We understood what the covenant, the marital covenant was. But I'll, I'll tell you this. Becoming one is relatively easy. All the married people said amen. All right? Now, living as one takes a whole lot of dying to yourself, <laughs> a lot of dying to your flesh. We had, a, you had, we had arguments like everyone else, you know. Today, I would say that our marriage is probably stronger than ever, but, but at the same time, we still, to this day, after many years, still have some of those moments of intense discussion, you know. <laughs> Read between the lines, I guess. But for the, you know, for the first few years, our disagreements, they were, they, were, they were ongoing. They were short and simple, and we moved on pretty quick. But as we have grown, and as we have been married for longer, as time has went on, we, our disagreements uh, seem to be a little bit bigger. We have a lot more bad to say, like hurtful things to say to each other on occasion. And I'll admit, most of our, our intense discussions are because I didn't do something or I didn't say something, or maybe I did something, or I didn't, you know, I, I, I just, it's, like, it's usually my fault, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> but when we really, truly began to cling to Jesus, and we really began to seek uh, Jesus in our marriage, I'll tell you, it changed our lives forever. And the first way that I want to talk to you about today that, that uh, Jesus changed our marriage is by helping us understand the priority the priority. In your life, your priority is supposed to be, number one, God, number two, your spouse, and number three, your kids. God, spouse, your kids, then all else after that. And you know, all the husbands in the room will relate to this, uh, but men are designed by God to be providers, to be fixers, right? Well, at least most of us want to fix things all the time. We want to provide for our family naturally. We want to fix all the problems. And many times that results in a very unhealthy uh, mindset regarding our priorities. And because we want to provide, you know, we tend to make our, our priority our jobs, our careers. You know, I certainly had that mindset early on. My wife was making her best effort to be supportive. At the same time, she was expressing, I need your attention. I need time with you. And I was thinking, I was over there thinking, well, I, for me to be able to give you that time, I have to be able to have a job and, and have money to bring you out and do certain things. And so I'm going to, I started to seek advancement. I started to seek uh, raises and better jobs. And, and so I was doing all these things thinking, I have to provide for her. If I really love her, I got to show her that I can be a provider. You know, the first few years of our, our marriage, I was working like 60 hours a week on the regular. Uh, at times, certain projects that was going on in my companies, that I, the companies that I worked in, we had, there were some projects that I was kind of the lead over or doing a bulk of the work, and I at times would bring my computer home, and I'd get off, I'd get home around like 6 o'clock, and I'd eat dinner for a few, a few minutes, and then I would sit down on my computer till like 2 a.m. and get back up at 5 Easily hitting you know 100 plus hours, 110 hours in a week. I did that way too often. Even when I started in full time ministry, the, the church that I was at in Texas, 
I, I worked so, I, I oversaw so much that I had, there was always events going on, and I always had this mindset that I needed to be there in order f- for my boss, my, my lead pastor, to be pleased, right? I had to, to please him and make him happy so that I could keep my job and get raises and bonuses and all that kind of stuff. And I was, I, even in full-time ministry, you know, there was times where, where I remember having, having fights, full-blown fights, because Michelle was like, you're telling me you're going to... You're going to be at the church on your daughter's birthday for six hours. And I was like, yeah, but I mean, I'll be home before her birthday party. And she's like, so you're telling me you're going to be at the church on your daughter's birthday for six hours? And I was like, yeah, but, you know, it's just in the morning, and then I'll get home, and we'll have the party, and things will be great. People, you know, there's people from the church that are going to be there, too, that are coming right after the party, or right after the event, too. And she's like, so you're telling me, you know, it just went, it's this vicious cycle, right? I'm a guy. I'm a guy. So, you know, I was going to church consistently. I worked there, right? I was, I was uh, leading worship often, pretty much every week. I was discipling people. But I spent more time trying to produce than I spent trying to prioritize my relationship with Christ. And because Christ was not at the center of my, my marriage, because God was not the top priority, it, it made it impossible for me to put my own wife first. Without realizing it, what happened was, is I was, I was unintentionally worshiping my job instead of God. Let me tell you, the things that are on your heart the most, if you are anything like me, anytime I get into a hobby, I will spend hours and hours and hours watching video after video and learning as much as I can, because if I'm going to do it, I want to know everything about it. Without realizing it, you may be worshiping your hobby, this activity that you enjoy, your job, and that quickly takes place where God is supposed to be. Remember, the Bible says in Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Don't put activities, don't put other people, don't put hobbies or your job in front of God, because when you do that, you're not going to be prioritizing your spouse either. I'm going to tell you a lot of stories today because I just enjoy telling stories. But one day, me and my wife, uh, we had... She had enough of the choices that I was making as a husband. You know, things were rocky. We went to a, a, a not a marriage conference, but a uh, a ministry conference, a leadership conference in Dallas. And while we were there, one of the the pastors spoke about Sabbath and priority. And of course, you know, I was thinking, I'm in ministry. I know what you're talking about. I've heard all this before. And I had literally had this mindset of, dude, I've, I've got multiple degrees. I've studied the Bible and the theology. I know, I know everything you're talking about. I, I, under, I appreciate him talking about it. I like to hear it. It's cool. But I don't, it's not really for me. That was my mindset at the time. And he started talking about balancing ministry and family. And, and he had the same mindset as I did for years because I mean, until his wife made it clear to him and he, he had a revelation from God. God told him one day, if you truly love me, or if you truly put me first, then you would put your wife first. And that's when it hit him. And, and church, I want, you, I want you to remember this scripture in 1 John 4, 19. It says, we love each other because he first loved us. That's the model we're supposed to follow. We, we are commanded to love each other the way that Christ loved us. Now, do you remember what Jesus said the greatest commandment is? Jesus said the greatest commandment. He put it in order for you, by the way. He says to love God and then love people. So if you were doing what you were supposed to be doing, you'd be loving God first over everything else, and then you'd be loving people. Uh, I want to remind you today, your wife, for all the husbands in the room, she has needs. Your husband has needs, and and meeting those needs should be a priority of yours. And if you start by putting God first in it all, it'll all make more sense. I'm not telling you it's going to be easy. I'm not telling you your life is going to be easy. If you are a Christian, you will be persecuted. The Bible talks about that. It's not going to be easy, but you're going to have help, only help, the help that only can come from God. If you put God first and at the center of your marriage, you'll begin to understand and meet those needs a lot easier than trying to figure it out on your own or trying to follow the worldly standards. You know, the world is, is trying to put you into that uh, 673,000 bracket. That's what the world is pushing you towards constantly. All, all the, all, uh, I can't tell you how many therapists that I've heard, or pe- from, I've heard from people that their therapists just recommended divorce. And I'm like, no, absolutely not. Let's talk about it from a different angle. But after, 
After this conference wrapped up that we were at, we attended a, a network lunch that was specific for the church, the churches that were part of this uh, bigger network that were at this conference together. And, and we were at the Texas Motor Speedway. It was really cool to, to be able to see that building. But I remember sitting in this room, and this pastor uh, that came to speak to us for the, for the lunch also talked about balancing marriage and, and, and work life or your family and work life, and talking about uh, your careers and stuff like that. And the things that he spoke to us at Texas Motor Speedway, I remember sitting there going, man, this is hitting me deep. I'm sure because I started earlier at the conference too, but it, it was hitting me real hard. It was hitting my wife. And you know, we had about a two and a half hour drive home. And, and the whole way we talked about what God was speaking to us during the conference, specific, especially when it came to our marriage. But I remember in that moment, we recommitted to each other, really I committed to her that I was going to put her first. And it led to a lot of tough conversations. When I got back telling my lead pastor, I'm not going to do certain things anymore. I have to put some boundaries up. And I had to tell my team the same thing. You can't call me every hour of every evening expecting me to stop what I'm doing to meet your needs or the church's needs. You know, I had to put some strict boundaries up. But that same night when we got back to the church, every first Wednesday, we had a night of worship and prayer where the church came together intentionally to, to pray for certain topics that we, uh, that we prayed about as a staff first and said, this, what, what should we pray about together? And then we would ha- we'd spend a lot of time in worship together. And I remember leading worship that night. And during a song that I was leading called Waymaker, I'm sure you guys sing that, right? One of my favorite songs. I remember singing this song and, and God just speaking into my heart and showing me things. And, and I remember he, he put a, a story, not a story, I guess it's a story now, but he put a, a thought back into my mind about, about my daughter when she was around four years old. From early on and still to this day, she loves bubblegum. I mean, when she was going to like pre-K and stuff like that, every morning we'd be in the car and she'd be like, Daddy, can I have bubble gum? And I'm, the answer is always no in the morning, by the way. <laughs> it's always like, hey, after school, I'll give you some bubble gum. But I remember this one day, what God reminded me of while I was leading Waymaker, I literally was singing this song and all these thoughts going through my head. I'm surprised I didn't sing the word bubble gum or something. That would have been weird. But I remember he, he reminded me of a story of a time where she asked me for bubble gum and I said, instead of just saying, hey, after school, I said, we're out of bubble gum. We don't have any. And she flipped out. She was like, I'm not accepting this. She was so angry. She was crying and crying and crying. And I was like, what on earth? This is not good. She's about to walk into school. She's hysterical right now. And, I'm, and so I remember asking her, I said, hey, baby, does daddy ever, well, first I told her, I'm going to buy some for you. And she didn't believe me. She kept crying. I said, I'm going to buy it before I, get, before I pick you up from school. You can have some after school. And then I remember asking her, does daddy ever break his promises? And immediately, she stopped crying. She cheered up. She had a big smile on her face because she knows if I said it, I'm going to do it. Church, we serve a God that never breaks his promises. We serve a God that has never broken a promise. He never will. And just like the song says, even when you don't see it, he's working. Even when you don't feel it, he's working. Look, you don't have to understand what he's doing or why he's doing it. You may never understand it. But the Bible says in Romans 8, 28, that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. He's working all things for good. He's working in your life, and he's going to work in your marriage, too. He's working all things, and it's for his glory, by the way, not for your own. That alone should make you want to praise, I tell you what. Point number two today on how God or how Jesus changes your marriage is by protection. Jesus changes your marriage by protecting it. And he does this through the Holy Spirit's working in your life. In John 14, 15 through 17, it says, if you love me and obey, or if you love me, obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. Now, the amplified version of this Bible, I enjoy reading it from that version because it breaks it out even more and tells you who else the Holy Spirit is to you. And it calls him helper instead of advocate at first. And then it says he's the comforter, the advocate, the intercessor, the counselor, strengthener, and standby. You know, all too often we hear about God. All too often you talk about Jesus and you hear about Jesus. But many times we fail to acknowledge the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. You know, I'm going to tell you a story. Now my wife's aware that I'm telling it. So we'll see how the ride home goes. (laughs) 
I told this story a few weeks to, a few weeks ago to my church, and I had to get permission. And when I asked her if I could tell the story, she didn't give me an answer right away. Out of like every few minutes, I was like, "So about that story?" She was like, "Eventually, she goes, okay, you could tell it." But when me and Michelle were just friends, I, I, I was I was on this mission to woo her. Right? You know, she had the hots from me. I'm convinced. She was, um, so I was like, I'm going to get this girl to like me, to love me, you know. And I remember I was, on, I was on my way to community college that I was attending after work. I was driving down uh, Ritchie Highway, Route 2. Anyone know about that road? Going through Glen Burnie, Severna Park, Arnold. It is nuts. It might as well be in Texas on, on Interstate 35, but that's the way that Route 2 is. But I was, tr- I was trying to get to, to the community college. I was stuck in traffic. I was on the phone with her, and she was telling me about this comforter that she's seen uh, at a store in Annapolis Mall. And she's like, hey, there's only one left. And I'm like, how do you know that? They, they don't even show inventory online. It's, <laughs> you know, it was many years ago. But anyways, she, she was telling me about it, and I was like, well, you know what? I'll, look, I'll go buy it for you. And she goes, no, 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 no. You have school. Don't, don't do that. Like, go to school. And I was like, okay. I mean, I, I don't mind. If you want it, I can get it. And she's like, no, I know you have to be in class. Because I already, already missed the class. I skipped school a lot. I was bad. So she was like, you need to be in class. I was like, all right, I'll go to school. And then I hear her go, but I really like it. <laughs> so I was like, I can go get it. She's like, no. And we went back and forth for like 10 minutes or so. So, you know, I was like, all right, I'm just going to go to class. How about that? And then, of course, I'm a man. I need to be the hero, right? So I was pulling up, about to turn into community college, and I was like, forget this. Put my cape on. I kept going. <laughs> I went to Annapolis Mall, and I found the comforter. Y'all, comforters ain't cheap. <laughs> I bought this comforter for her. I couldn't pay my truck payment after that. <laughs> I was young. I didn't make a lot of money. And so, you know, but I got her the comforter and I got the wife. Look at that. So she didn't marry me just for the comforter, I don't think, right? I've told this story to multiple friends of groups uh, in, all, in all fun, you know, but later on in life, I remember uh, I'd, I'd, I'd see her bring these comforters home every so often and she'd make the, the bed all magazine photo ready. And I was like, oh, cool. So it's time to go to bed. And I'm walking up to the bed, about to lay down. And she's like, nope, you got to pull it down. And I didn't know comforters are only allowed to look comfortable. <laughs> You're not allowed to feel the comfort of a comfort of a comfort. I, look, I tell you this in all fun to make it memorable. I mean, it's a true story. But I, I want you to remember this. While you're not allowed to feel the comfort of a comforter on your bed, that's not the case for our comforter, the Holy Spirit. He's not just for looks or for show. He's for use. He's ready to guide you. He's ready to advocate for you. He is ready to comfort you and to help you. He is there with you to speak to you and to protect you. And if you rely on the leading of the Holy Spirit, he will guide you in your marriage and he will protect your marriage. So anyone in this room... Uh, any hunters in this room? There was a few. There's a couple. Oh, okay, I see, a, I see a few. Look at that. Anyone ever been to Blackwater Refuge? <laughs> okay, so there's uh, no one. All right, I don't think. Unless I missed a hand. So there's these little deer that are like uh, little miniature elk. They're called sicka deer. And they live in swamps, right? So Blackwater Refuge is on the other side from where I live. I don't know how, how to get there from here. But on the other side of the Bay Bridge, it's this wildlife marshy area that you have to get special permissions to hunt. And I remember last year, I went out there uh, with a buddy. We walked about two miles or so, a mile and a half to two miles in, in, you know, know, mud, like knee-high boots, eight to 10 inches of water, sometimes higher, mud, really hard walk. Just like three o'clock in the morning, we're walking already. And by the way, when anytime you go over there to any kind of swamp, but especially black water, there's like these massive... uh, bird-sized devil bugs. They call them mosquitoes. They're not mosquitoes. They're so big, you can see the hair on them. And, and I, I remember sitting in a tree one day over there, and I had three layers on plus a puffy jacket, and I was still getting bit through the... These mosquitoes are crazy. But I remember we, we, me and my buddy, we finally got to where we wanted to set up, and we climbed up in this tree. It's still dark out. And on the way in, we kept seeing this fox show up. He kept following us. He knew we knew where we were going. And so I was set up right on a deer trail, and I I was, you know, I was up in my stand, and 
and I, I was getting bit up a little bit. I turned on some thermos cells and all that. It's still dark out. It's the best time of the day is when you're, you know, it's pitch black, you can't see anything. It's a little freaky out there. There's some animals I've never heard in the normal woods. You'll hear it out there. But I remember sitting there, and I'm thinking, all right, today's going to be cool because I hear deer all around me, but I, I keep hearing them run. And I'm like, why do they keep spooking off like that? Come to find out, this fox kept coming around, kept leaving and coming around, and, and the sick of deer were, were all spooked by him. And so I remember uh, one morning while we were out there, this fox, I was thinking, uh, he's got to go or some. I don't know what's going to happen, but I was thinking it was going to be a good day. I didn't see the fox for a while. The sun's up by now, and I see this stag. The stags are the one with the antlers. It was a nice one. It was coming down this trail, and I'm like, oh, snap. It's coming down the, the trail that I needed him to come down. I have a perfect 10-yard shot if he came, if he, if he didn't turn. And he's making his way down. I'm holding my bow. Anyone who's been hunting knows the minute you have that bow in hand and you see an animal that you're about to try to uh, eat, you, uh, you start shaking. The adrenaline kicks in, and every bit of me was shaking. It was, it was freezing cold out and stuff, and I'm like, oh, this... Okay, I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to breathe slowly, right? And I remember this, this stag, as it was, it was making his way there, he was about now 15 yards out. He just needed to break this group of trees to get out into my clearing, into my, my uh, 10-yard window. And I see him start picking his head up and looking at a particular direction, and he'd drop it back down without moving from that 15-yard-ish area. And he was eating, and he'd pick his head up and look over there again, and he'd stop, and he'd... He'd pick his head up again and look again. And I was thinking, what on earth is going on? So I looked behind me to see where that fox is, because he kept laying down for a little bit behind me. And I was like, oh, the fox is not there. Then out of nowhere, I see the fox, a little sneaky thing, made his way around the hill. And that deer looked at him, and that deer took off running. This fox, uh, by the way, it had me so frustrated that, uh, let's just say this. He made his way into the 10-yard window. <laughs> Make your own assumptions. I never got a shot off on the deer. All day long, I watched deer come down this trail, one after another, and he spooked him away. But it, this fox got me thinking about marriage. I don't know why. But let me ask you this question. How often in your marriage do you feel like you're on the right path? Things are going really well. You know, you're meeting your spouse's needs. Everything's going great, and something around you distracts you. And now you're no longer looking the right direction. I mean, this fox was sneaky. It kept slipping in and out, undetected, barely heard it moving. You know, one after another, he distracted and pushed away the deer that were coming to me. Church, the enemy does the exact same thing. The enemy sneaks his way in, and he causes distractions that take you off of the path that God has laid out for you. And it could be a number of things. It could be a financial distraction. It could be a health distraction. It could be other people at work or wherever you meet them at, men or women. It could be pornography. Whatever it is, the enemy will constantly try and cause distractions, strife, problems. I heard another pastor say it like this. If the enemy can't destroy you, he will distract you. And we need the Holy Spirit to guide us and protect us from the enemy so that we don't give the enemy any room to cause division in our marriage. And so as I was preparing to preach a few weeks ago at my church, and I was also preparing messages for, for our mission trip that we went on to in Nicaragua, I had this mind-blowing realization about the Holy Spirit uh, and how he works in our lives. I, I, I was reading in Acts, and it says, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place, and suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire, of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit. There's two things that I want to point out real quick about the, from this passage about the Holy Spirit. The first one is the Holy Spirit settled on every believer in the room. The second one is that the Holy Spirit came in the form of fire and wind. Now, I want to stop and talk about wind for a moment. How many of you know that wind is a powerful thing? I mean, wind has the ability to cool you down when you are hot. Uh, I lived in Texas. Uh, this humidity you have here is disgusting, by the way. Um, where I was at in Texas, there was, it was dry. But wind has the ability to cool you down. Now, it also has the ability to create electricity, to create energy, right? Now, if you think about it from a, from a different angle now, wind has the ability to tear down trees, 
to rip through buildings and, and, and just create destruction if it comes in the form of tornadoes or hurricanes or other storms. Wind is powerful. Now I want you to take a moment and, and think about what happens when you talk, when you speak. If you ever put your hand in front of your mouth when you speak, you can feel your breath, right? Or maybe that guy that gets a little bit too close in people's personal bubbles and they, you know, they're talking to you and you feel his hot breath on your face. However you feel it. When you speak, air comes from your lungs out of your mouth. Now, when God speaks... What we read in Genesis is, is that when God speaks, he creates, I mean, he, from, from nothing, he created what, everything that we see. He, creates, he created animals, the, the, the sky, the, the land, trees, everything. It's, it's incredible. The same thing that happens when, when God speaks, the same thing happens. Wind comes from his lungs out of his mouth, and then he creates everything, right? Now, Jesus, when he was here on earth, when he spoke, some powerful things happened too. I mean, with his words, he rose Lazarus from the dead. He healed people. He calmed storms. He did a number of things, turned water into wine. I mean, there's multiple things that he did with his words. And the same thing happens when he speaks. Wind comes, air, wind comes from his lungs out of his mouth. Now, me and my wife, I know I, know I mentioned I have three babies now, but we had just started fostering uh, Late last year, we finished the class. We had our first placement early in January for about 45 days. So we went from a family of three to a family of four for one day. He was, he was put back with his mom. And uh, for one day, we, had, we were back to a family of three. And then we got two babies. So jumped up to a family of five, um, both of them in diapers, you know. And so we, we were adjusting. And then we were getting ready to go to our uh, mission trip with our, our teenagers from the, from the church, a group of 17 or 16 of them, I think. And um, as we were preparing for that, we got a call that they, the two that we had now have a sibling that was born just hours before they called us. And they were like, will you take him in? And we, with so much joy and excitement, were like, yes, we, we want him, like bring him to us. We were also really sad about what was taking place. He had drugs in his system, and so he had to stay in the hospital for it was like three weeks, I think it was, before we finally got to meet him and, and, and bring him into our home. But while we were gone and while I was preparing for those other messages even, because of, of that situation, I started to think, man, what happens when a baby is born? When a baby is born, the very first thing that happens is he breathes, he or she, right? He breathes and he starts to cry. And that is, there is purpose behind that breath. And just so you get the full scope of what, my point here, there is a Greek word that's translated, uh, that, that's translated as spirit, and the, the word is pneuma. That word is also translated to mean breath. Now, the Holy Spirit is sometimes also, in Scripture, referred to as the breath of God. So imagine the breath of this baby boy who was born five weeks early, who's in the hospital, who's hooked up to feeding tubes and stuff, and just, just in a really sad situation. Just imagine the first thing that that baby got to do when he came out of the breath, and he got to breathe. Now, he, many theologians, that, when I was reading about the Holy Spirit and the breath of God, Many theologians talk about the, the name Yahweh. The name Yahweh is spelled Y-H-W-H. And they say that this spelling is the only, it, it only allows you, this the only consonants that allow, or does not allow you to use your, your lips or touch your uh, tongue, or say that the wrong way, to use your tongue or touch your lips together. Yahweh. Yahweh is meant to imitate and replicate breathing. Inhalation and exhalation. So think about it for a second. When we breathe, when this baby breath breathes, we are speaking the name of Jesus. The first thing out of a baby's mouth is the name of, of, of God, Yahweh. Let me just hear it for a second. When you, when you say it, Yahweh, Yahweh, that is the name of, I mean, every time you stand in this room to worship him with every breath that you take, I would assume that every single person in this room is breathing. You are all, without realizing it, calling on the name of God. Every breath that you take, from the, from the day that you were born until the day that you die, you are calling on the name of God. Why do you think God meets you in this room whenever you gather together? Because we're all calling on the name of God and worshiping him because he is worthy. Look, with every breath that you breathe, 
The Spirit of God will guide you. That's why he indwells in you. The, the breath of God, the Holy Spirit, is working in your lives to change your merit for the good, and it's for his glory and not for your own. The last thing that I want to talk to you today, point number three, is that Jesus changes your marriage by provision, by providing. And look, I can give you story after story about how God provided for my wife and I, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, make it quick. The first uh, one of them, so whenever I, a few weeks ago, when we got that call, I was in the middle of preparing a message, and so it just naturally made its way in. And I made a joke to the church, and I said, hey, look, when we come back from Nicaragua, we're going to be on a search for a minivan. And uh, everyone there knows I'm, I'm a true Texan. I drive a pickup truck. You can't fit six people in a pickup truck, let alone three of them in car seats, right? And so I was like, <laughs> you know, I got to get a minivan. What am I going to do with my life? I just joking around. Well, we had a couple just a few hours later contact us and say, hey, we are, you know, the, the military is moving us to Japan. We can't take this minivan with us. Uh, we were going to sell it, but we want to give it to you. I mean, that is the power. Just God, God's provision is amazing, isn't he? But when my wife and I just got married early on in our life, we were both ready to start a family. You know, we both had the same desire to have kids. I mean, the same exact, the same exact desire. She wanted uh, five. I wanted two. So it's not. <laughs> she's winning. Uh, but we, we tried and we tried and we tried for a long time to have kids. And, and it was so sad and depressing because uh, it just wasn't happening. We had friends around us getting pregnant and having their kids and stuff. And we were just bummed constantly, right? So we talked to our doctor. The doctor said, hey, it's going to be nearly impossible for you to have a baby naturally. Now, you could spend $30,000 and have a possibility of maybe, not even a promise, but a maybe. I mean... We, Michelle was devastated. I was devastated. You know, uh, it just really wasn't working. And so, so one day, I remember being at church. We had already moved to Texas at this point, thinking that we would never have a kid, right? I remember being at church, and I started to, I was leading worship, and I looked down, and, and I remember seeing Michelle at the front of the stage, just on her knees, broken. And every time I think about it, I get emotional. She was she was just broken in tears, and, and I was trying to lead worship, and I was like, I can't sing through this, you know. And I remember after church, she told me, she, she finally decided, enough is enough, I'm going to give this to God. I'm going to trust him with it. And, and she told me that, that she had committed to God. She said, if you bless us with a child, we will give it back to you. They will be worshipers. They will serve you. They will be God-fearing and God-loving people. So we started to lean on this scripture, Psalms 37, 4. It says, take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And at this point, you know, like, so we were in Texas now. So we found a different doctor, and she went to the doctor, and she heard the same thing, the same diagnosis. It'd be a near impossibility. But we continue to lean on God for provision. Look, it was hard. It was a very testing time for our, for our relationship, for our faith even. Michelle felt ashamed and guilty that she couldn't give me what, what I wanted. I felt ashamed and guilty that I couldn't give her what she desired, what she, what she wanted, and you know, I couldn't fix it. I'm a guy. I'm a fixer. I couldn't fix it. It, it was a really tough time. But in, you know, we constantly reminded ourselves, as hard as it is, we're going to still choose joy. We're going to take delight in the Lord. We're going to trust him. You know, I'm not saying it always looked good you know, or perfect. It was hard. But not long after that, we had a, 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 something that we did at our church every year. We started the year off with 21 days of prayer and fasting. And we decided this year we were going we to focus on praying for a baby together. We're going to be hopeful, as hopeful as we can, and, and, and put our faith in God, and this is going to happen. And every so many days, we'd, have, we'd take a pregnancy test, and every so many days, that pregnancy test would come back, and it, I mean, it would it'd be a negative. It was, so, it was so hard. You know, after the 21 days of prayer and fasting was over, and another negative test, we decided, hey, let's just take some time and go visit family. My family was still in Maryland at the time because they had moved up here. They moved me up here in high school. Um, and then Michelle's family still lives here. So we were like, let's just go, uh, you know, to fly to Maryland and spend some time up there. So we, we did. We, we flew up to Maryland. And I still remember the look on Michelle's face when she, she got up to do something in the house and she was on her way. Uh, she was walking through the house and my dad goes, Michelle, are you pregnant? 
Can you imagine? Everybody knows you don't ask a woman if she's pregnant unless you 100% know and you confirmed it secretly with someone else that knows. You, you don't ask that, you know? She was mad. I mean, she was livid. And here I am going, I can't fix this. She's, <laughs> I don't know what to do. Like, I'm, now I'm mad, you know? And so we ended up flying back to Texas when we got done with our, our little trip and we went back to work, went about our lives. And I remember one day she came home from work and she said, I feel different. I don't feel sick, but I feel different. And I said, well, if you're not sick, what are we supposed to do? And she said, I don't know. So we decided, well, let's just, take a, let's just do another pregnancy test. It won't hurt anybody. We didn't have any hope at this point, but we were going to do it anyway, so we did it. And then we, you know, she did her thing. We set it down for a little bit, went away, came back to it, and together we looked at it to find a positive test. Now we have this nine-year-old girl who, such a miracle. We, uh, we took her to Nicaragua with us, and we got to see her serve so selflessly in, in the second poorest country in Central America, and she just completely blew our minds. But church, you know, when we, I'll tell you this, when I saw that test, I went to Walmart, I was like, we're going to trek again, so I bought every test that was there. <laughs> And she tried multiple. They were all positive. Of course, it, you know, it worked. But church, I want to tell you this. What the world says is impossible. God says all things are possible if you believe in me. When the world says your marriage probably won't last more than eight years, because that's what the world says on all these studies that I read. Eight years is the max. So they're saying, but God says, no, you're united as one, and your marriage is a covenant that will last forever. When the world says your marriage will be a living hell because that's what they're trying to portray on the news and everything else, Jesus steps in and says, forget that my Father's kingdom come, his will be done in your marriage. That's what Jesus is saying. Look, he will give you the desires of your heart. He will meet your needs. He will protect you and he will provide for you. He is the game changer. He changes everything and he'll change your marriage. I want to challenge you today to make the Lord the priority in your life and in your marriage, and he'll, he'll protect you and he'll provide for you. I can promise you that. So church, would you do me a favor and just bow your heads and close your eyes? I want to ask you a couple of questions. If you're in this room or maybe you're watching online today and your marriage is on the rocks or maybe things have been tough for a while and you're not sure if it's going to work, that's what you're thinking at least, or maybe you're at this breaking point because things aren't happening quite the way that you thought it would and you're thinking, Mike, I need that protection in my life. I need it in my marriage. I need God's provision the way you are talking about it. I need that kind of story to be able to tell. If that's you, I want you to just do me a favor. I want to pray with you. Would you raise your hands for me so I can pray over you today? I see, I see several hands. Amazing. Amazing. This is good. Well, another question I want to ask you, maybe you're in this room or online and, and you realize that you haven't been putting God first in your life. Or you might be thinking, Look, I've, I've never even made him the Lord and Savior of my life, and you want to take that step and ask Jesus to come into your life and change your life and change your relationships and change your marriage. I want you to do me a favor as well and go ahead and raise your hands nice and high. Amen. Look, we're going to pray here in a second, but I want to tell you also, before you leave today, make sure that you tell uh, someone here that you made this decision today to accept Christ, because I'm sure they want to be able to provide you next steps on how to live your life with Christ. But let's go ahead and pray. Would you repeat after me and say, Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins, and I invite you to come into my heart and come into my life. I want to trust you, and I want to follow you as the Lord and Savior of my life. Amen. God, we thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you for your son, that, that sacrifice that you made to give him to us. Holy Spirit, I ask that you guide us through every day of our life. I pray protection from the distractions of the enemy. Lord, I pray that you would be the foundation that our relationships and our marriages are built on. Father, right now, I pray that you would meet the needs of our marriages. 
Father, I pray that you would provide for us, not for our own sake, Father, but so we can turn around and tell others about your goodness. I pray for restoration, reconciliation, and a renewed love for every person in this room. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you, Pastor. Church, will you stand as you're able so we can worship, continue in worship?
Thank you for your goodness and your mercy, God. For your provision and your protection, God. Will you remind us as we go through this week to lean in, to make you our priority. To trust your protection, to trust your provision, to trust your goodness. Because all, all my life you've been faithful. All my life you've been faithful. All our lives you've been faithful. Will you show us the ways that maybe we haven't seen when we look back on our lives? Will you reveal that to us? that we can see your consistency and your promises. You do not fail. You keep your promises. You are a good, good father. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for this time to gather together. We honor you. We give you all the glory and all the praise. It's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you all so much for being here today and worshiping together. What a joy. What a joy. If you'd like prayer, is here up um, to your right and remember that you matter deeply to God. We'll see you next week.